And I'm Deb Alice. I am a physician assistant. I've been in bariatrics for several years. I'm at New Vance Health in Fairfield County, Connecticut, and I am your moderator for tonight's webinar. Uh, our speakers tonight are Brittany Howard, physician assistant, and Dr. Betsy Dovek, who will be uh, discussing the impact of GLP, GIP medications on our bariatric surgery practices, giving us uh, strategies and insights. So before we get started, um, just to let you know, this webinar series is brought to you by the Advanced Practice Provider Committee. Um, and I would like to say a word about our annual meeting that's coming up in June. It'll be here before you know it. Um, so this is our annual meeting is going to be in San Diego, California. Um, the dates are June 9th to 13th. And I really encourage all our participants um, on the webinar to attend. First of all, it's the 40th meeting. It's the 40th anniversary. So come on, we need a celebration. And we have a lot of great content. Uh, and it, that will be including an assessment-based certificate for APPs in uh, obesity medicine as it relates to our bariatric surgery practices. So um, again, those dates are June 9th to 13th. We're gonna be in San Diego, who doesn't love palm trees? Palm trees make me happy. So everybody should come. Um, so just for tonight, some housekeeping before we get started. Um, all participants are muted. Um, however, I will be reading your, um, in, please use the Q&A panel. Um, where I'll be reading your questions to our two speakers um, after um, they have given their talks. So, um, and I'll try and get to as many of them as possible. And hopefully I have about three or four pairs of reading glasses, just in case. Um, so to get started, we have um, Brittany Howard. Um, she is a senior PA, uh, first assist and a coordinator. Um, because APPs wear many hats, um, at the Womack uh, Army Medical Center in uh, Fort Liberty, North Carolina. She has a passion for health and fitness, received her BS in uh, exercise physiology from the University of Utah, and she is a professional bodybuilder. So Brittany's going to speak with us tonight about the uh, impact of injectables on our uh, bariatric surgery uh, practices. Brittany, thanks so much for joining us. Well, hello, and thank you, Deb, for that lovely introduction. I'm honored to be here and be part of the talks, and let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, can everybody see this okay? All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the impact of GLP-1s and GIP medications on bariatric surgery practice. Disclosures, I don't have any, but a girl can hope for some, right? All right, we're gonna talk about some objectives here, understanding the mechanism of GLP-1 and GIP medications, identifying the appropriate patient selection for these medications, and to discuss the use of GLP-1 and GIP medications in synergy with metabolic and bariatric surgery. All right. So I really love this graphical representation of the risk, benefit, and cost of how we are able to treat obesity. I do believe medicine as a whole, across most disciplines, is not placing enough emphasis on lifestyle changes, not just diet and exercise, but on how mental health, sleep, pain, stress, and a whole host of other factors contribute to obesity and can be treated fairly invasively and affordably. Alas, I've already digressed, <laughs> digressed from where we were talking about in the first place. However, this is one of my favorite um, uh, graphs that I have found to uh, talk about the different options for treatment. So we all hear about how injectable medications are catching up to bariatric surgery in terms of weight loss results. When I did sit down and actually created this uh, table um, of the expected weight loss percentages, I was actually pretty underwhelmed, seeing that anti-obesity medication is only an expected 22% maximum, where we have all these other procedures that are maximum 50% or more for excess body weight loss. So... Indications for anti-obesity medication use, um, it's a BMI of greater than 30. Um, otherwise, it's a great BMI of greater than 27 with at least one um, obesity-related comorbidity. And those are gonna be things that we utilize um, 
to determine if the patient is also good for bariatric surgery. These are the most commonly prescribed anti-obesity medications. We're not going to go through all of them tonight. We're going to focus instead on lyroglutide, semiglutide, and trizepatide, the GLP-1s and GIP medications. So let's get into those medications. The mechanism of action. So glucagon, like peptide 1, and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptides, which I'm going to refer to as GLP-1 and GIP, because that is just a heck of a mouthful, are incretin hormones that are produced in the small and large intestines as a response to food. They have several effects. They include the stimulation of insulin secretion in the pancreas when there is glucose in the bloodstream and decrease in glucagon secretion. They also decrease gastric emptying and slow the absorption of carbohydrates, which in turn decreases extreme blood glucose excursions after meals. A decrease in appetite happens in the hypothalamus, resulting in an increase in perceived satiety and leads to decreased intake overall. They also improve adipose tissue function like lipolysis via GLP-1s and increasing lipogenesis by GIPs. They decrease inflammation, promote proliferation of pancreatic beta cells, and have a cardioprotective effect that is still under investigation. Decreased secretion of GLP-1s and GIP hormones may lead to elevated blood glucose levels and obesity. GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP agonists act as analogs of the naturally produced GLP-1 and GIP found in the body. So some contraindications and cautions prior to prescribing. The contraindications, I think most people have heard of these, personal family history of um, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, uh, personal family history of medullary thyroid cancer, pregnancy, and if you have a hypersensitivity to the drug or acceptance in the, the drug. The cautions and considerations are a little bit different, and I actually didn't know as many of these as um, af until after I researched for this talk. So as far as known and active gallbladder disease, GLP-1 and GIP medications can increase the risk of developing cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. In the pancreas, it has been postulated that the stimulation of GLP-1 receptors in pancreatic islets and exocrine duct cells by incretin therapies, GLP-1 and GIP, may lead to overgrowth of the cells that cover the smaller ducts, resulting in hyperplasia, chronic low-grade or acute inflammation. However, this is yet to be fully proven. Um, those who have diabetic retinopathy may experiencing experience a worsening of their condition due to the rapid lowering of blood glucose levels. An acute kidney injury may occur also worsening chronic kidney disease, especially in patients who are experiencing severe gastrointestinal side effects, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Gastroparesis can be further worsened due to the nature of the mechanism of action, which we did just talk about for GLP-1 and GIPs. And while GLP-1 and GIPs have a low risk for inducing hypoglycemia, the concomitant use of insulin and or insulin secretagogues may increase the risk of hypoglycemia. It is recommended to decrease the dose of insulin or sulfonylurea during treatment with GLP-1 and GIP medications for this reason. So an evaluation prior to prescribing, a great patient history to make sure that patients don't have any contraindications or have any concerns, of course, for taking these medications. Um, verifying current medications that they're on, evaluating the possible drug interactions, that's really important for me as well, even though GLP-1 and GIPs don't have a huge drug-drug um, interaction that I've noticed yet. I don't routinely order thyroid ultrasound, gallbladder studies, or consult ophthalmology, However, this is highly patient dependent. And I may actually start doing some of these things more frequently now that I have done all this research for this presentation. I always do a full lab review on patients prior to prescribing. Some of the side effects are gonna be often due to the mechanism of slower gastric emptying. They are common within the first four weeks of medication initiation. They typically decrease with continued medication use resolving about week six. They are oftentimes dose dependent and patients may experience an increase in side effects around the time of their weekly injection, especially when going up a dose in these medications. A few tips that I typically give patients about how to reduce their side effects are to eat smaller portions and more frequent meals. Stop eating before they feel full and avoid eating trigger foods that 
such as fried foods, greasy foods, or oily foods. Another thing to do is always stay hydrated. Drink at least 64 ounces of water, if not more. All right. So while I mostly use anti-obesity medications post-operatively for weight recurrence and weight loss plateaus within one to two years of surgical procedures, I'm going to focus on how GLP-1s and GIP medications can work in synergy pre-operatively with bariatric surgery. I noted two studies regarding a reduction in preoperative risk. Sun et al. reported patients with a preoperative total body weight loss of 0 to 5%, 5 to 9.9%, and 10% had a 24%, 31%, and 42% respectively of a lower risk of 30-day mortality. Another study that was performed by Mokanu et al. found a benefit from greater than 10% preoperative weight loss leading to a 30% decrease odds of leak and a 40% decrease in odds of mortality compared to no preoperative weight loss. While I do not believe that a preoperative weight loss should be mandated as it previously has been instituted by insurance companies and is discriminatory, I do believe our patients deserve the best outcomes and risk reductions for these elective surgeries. Our program does not require a preoperative weight loss goal at this time. We do, however, require that our patients do not gain weight prior to surgery. That shows us that they're bought into the program, they're bought into um, furthering their weight loss goals. So my rationale for using GLP-1 and GIP use is a little bit more program specific. Specifically, I started using these medications when I found out when we had a patient that was over 500 pounds that our institution does not have a bed to accommodate patients in the OR of greater than 500 pounds. So that's when I started taking a look at our patients that have very high BMIs and saying, hey, what do we need to do to help these patients get to surgery? Now, another reason I like to utilize these medications prior to surgery is that patients with very high BMI, which were previously considered super obese or super morbid obesity, are not always able to meet their weight loss and comorbid resolution goals with surgery alone. These patients have placed their trust in us to provide them with a way to improve their health, longevity, and functional ability. I don't take that their decision lately, and I want to ensure that I am one of their biggest supporters through their weight loss journey. That includes having the education and understanding regarding using a multimodal approach of medication and surgery to help them reach those goals, improve comorbid conditions, and be happy with the outcomes and this huge step that they have taken overall. So obesity medication and bariatric surgery are not in competition, at least not in my practice. At WOMAC, we do not have a comprehensive non-surgical weight loss program associated with our bariatric surgical service or one within the hospital system for that matter. We are a small program and I am actually the sole provider within our bariatric clinic that does prescribe anti-obesity medications. I work very closely with our primary care providers and clinical pharmacologists who also prescribe at our institution. Using anti-obesity medications as a synergistic tool in concert with metabolic and bariatric surgery, especially in patients with very high BMIs, may improve surgical outcomes, quality life, and patient satisfaction. However, I do recognize the vast difference in expected outcomes if using singular, singularly. To illustrate that difference, let's look at patients with BMIs of 47, 42, and 36. As you can see, if these hypothetical patients lost the maximum expected excess body weight while using an anti-obesity medication, in this case, a GLP-1 or a GIP, the final BMI is much higher and still within the obese range compared to having that same patient undergo a RUNI gastric bypass and was able to lose the maximum estimated excess body weight. When I created this table, I was actually pretty shocked at how vastly different these numbers were. So some personal observations that I have about anti-obesity medications and bariatric surgery and how they can work synergistically. I've noticed that they are recommended to be taken for life by bariatricians. Specifically, I heard that from Dr. Cleek, who works at Roper St. Francis down in Charleston, South Carolina. And we're understanding that obesity is a chronic, long-term, multifaceted condition with continued research. 
I counsel my patients regarding the lifetime use of anti-obesity medications preoperatively and postoperatively. I like to explain to them if these medications are discontinued, the weight loss mechanisms of action may no longer work. Patients will likely feel hunger. They may increase their portion sizes and see an overall change in their metabolism. I always caveat this, in, this by informing patients that if they create a sustainable lifestyle change to include a change in dietary habits and exercise, discontinuation of these medications does not mean an automatic recurrence of their weight. When discussing treatments of obesity with my patients, I have found that they are when they are provided through education regarding the risks, benefits, and especially the expectations of anti-obesity medications, they often choose not to start anti-obesity medications and instead proceed with a surgical pathway. Many patients do not consider what may happen if they change jobs, start a family, increase their family size, retire, relocate, et cetera, and no longer have the coverage or ability to pay for these medications, some of which may cost up upward of $1,400 per month out of pocket. Many of these patients are seeking to reduce the number of their medications. They're not taking the, that they are taking, I'm sorry, many patients may are trying to reduce the number of medications that they're taking through utilizing surgery, not adding a medication that may be very expensive. And as we are seeing right now in our current climate, pretty much an inability to find it. A decrease in referrals and surgeries is a concern that I have heard voiced by many bariatric surgeons. Our clinic has actually not experienced a decrease in referrals and our surgical numbers have actually increased, even with some of our surgeons being deployed currently. I can see the argument regarding a delay in some patients enrolling in a surgical pathway if they are trying the medication route first. However, I do not believe that there is adequate weight loss occurring for patients to have great improvement in comorbid conditions or reach their weight loss goals. We also know that weight recurrence is possible after the discontinuation of these medications. So overall, I believe that these medications can be used together and that they probably should be used together. So while I was doing research for this presentation, I came up with a few questions myself. Um, I want to know the negative effect of weight recurrence after discontinuation of these medications. It has been sens sensationalized in the media, but do we really know how many patients this is happening to? If there's any lasting effect of GLP-1 and GIP medications after treatment, is their metabolism improved? How do they have uh, lipolysis that continues. We don't know all these answers that as the medications still haven't been fully embedded. It'd be interesting to research if patients who undergo single stage procedures lose more weight than those who undergo a multiple stage procedure. We've previously utilized a sleeve and then the bypass technique in patients who have had a very, very high BMI, uh, upwards of 60 or more. We're also now utilizing procedures like the SADES and the uh, duodenal switch for patients that have very high BMIs. Our practice is sometimes that we do stage them in two different procedures, doing a sleeve first and then six months later coming back and finishing the duodenal switch. It may be possible that patients are going to see wet, less weight loss if we dual stage those procedures. And if we are able to get the patients down to a lower weight prior to doing one procedure, they may lose weight overall. However, that is all that I have for you tonight. This is my lovely dog. Uh, his name is Baymax, and I hope he brightens everybody's day. Here are my references, and I'm excited to hear questions from you all after this. Great. Thank you, Brittany. That was excellent. And um, as Brittany said, please um, feel free to use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen, right next to the participant button. Um, we are anticipating a very robust Q&A um, period after Dr. Dovek's talk. So uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Betsy Dovek. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Body by Bariatrics, which offers uh, comprehensive surgical uh, obesity treatment options. She is a board certified general surgeon. She's a fellow of the uh, American College of Surgeons and the ASMBS. Uh, she's also a diplomat of the American uh, Board of Obesity Medicine. Dr. Dovek has over a decade of experience as a bariatric surgeon. She, um, having part, uh, practiced in one of the country's 
busiest surgical and medical weight loss programs in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, she has since moved her practice to Florida. I was speaking of palm trees earlier. Um, uh, and tonight she's going to share her insights with us on uh, obesity medication as it relates to our bariatric surgery practices. Thanks, Dr. Dobek. Thank you so much. I am very excited. Great job to Brittany and to all. And I'm going to share my screen. And uh, Deb, can you see this? Can you give me a nod if you can? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's get started. So I have a lot of slides to go through. And my goal in this presentation is for us as bariatric surgeons and those practicing in the specialty to feel very comfortable with embracing the medical weight loss space. So I want you to feel like, yes, I can incorporate this into my practice. Brittany talked some about the preoperative. If you have a patient, the one that she gave with the 500 pound and the weight limit, and you're trying to do these surgeries, obviously safer and more effective. Well, here we go. I'm going to talk a lot about the post-op. And I feel that we do have a big responsibility when we have patients who come back and they're stuck on plateaus or they've experienced some weight regain. And what can we do to them other than say, kind of go back to the basics of nutrition? So I have found that in my practice, I've really embraced this. I have a lot of um, post-op patients who do these medical weight loss um, treatments, and they're doing great. So with that, um, we're going to go for it. Um, I do have some disclosures. I obviously own um, my private practice. I am the co-founder of New Tri Health and a consultant for Ethicon. So today we're going to dive into the meds, how they work, how you sh what you should do, how you should take them, when you should potentially avoid prescribing meds, how you should do it, what is your treatment algorithm, and really just how do you, this is my, in my opinion, my best practices and how you can incorporate this into yours and really always think about that patient experience. So yes, bariatric surgery is um, at the forefront. It's the most effective tool that we have. And Brittany showed that on one of our earliest slides about the efficacy and excess body weight loss. But when you add maybe a medication post-op and add it earlier than you may even think with exercise, nutrition, with the, the mindset changes and sleep, you can really have a true comprehensive effective program as well. So this is what our program is. We want patients to be involved and truly engaged for at least one year. And we have them select a package of different things. There's different tiers. You can see our dietitian. You can get a customized meal plan. But at the base of it, we have five visits throughout that year. And it's great because it helps you even if they're more than a year, two, three years out. And we know that we have a hard time having patients follow up once they go out there a longer spans of time from surgery. This really gets them back engaged with your program and your resources and your support groups and that sort of thing. We have them complete a questionnaire. And before we will see them for that consultation, we want them to get that full set of labs. She said that as well. In addition, I do a group session. And this, what I'm about to show you, is the group session that I give to my patients. So you're getting it just like they get it. So hopefully I really simplify it because I am trying to speak to them as well. They have their one-on-one -on -one with me. We select a medication and I'll tell you how I do that. And then I complete the documentation. I take care of all of the prior authorization. I will appeal it. I will do everything I can until I get to the point where I feel that I've exhausted all options for that patient. And then we might pivot to another medication. If we get the approval, they'll start on it. They see me every three months and we get results. If they don't, we'll change the medication. If they're having side effects, I might change it. If they're not losing enough weight, we might increase the dose, add another medication, add something like toperamate to fentramine to make it Qsimia. So we have a plan in place to make sure that they succeed. So like I said, we review labs, and then this is a great time to get back to the basics of those nutritional labs. I review 12 different labs, including CBC, CMP, all the vitamins, the PTH is how I look at calcium. I will do a lipid panel just for some great starting baseline of their health, thyroid. I'm looking at um, liver functions 
Uh, and I check an insulin level because I want to see if they have hyperinsulinemia. In addition to a hemoglobin A1C and the fasting blood sugar and the CMP, I also want to see what their insulin level is as well, because that can be very indicative of them having some issues. I make sure that I reiterate the importance of lifelong vitamins. I just happen to have Celebrate. I don't care what brand that they go with. If they go with Bariatric Advantage, Bariatric Fusion, ProCare, Celebrate, or even an over-the-counter one, and we make sure that they're taking it correctly. They're separating it by at least two hours. As we know, the divalent cations of calcium and iron compete for absorption in the duodenum. So we want to make sure that they are separating it, taking it appropriately. And unfortunately, some of them come back and say, oh, I kind of got off a track. I haven't been doing it. So it's a great way to getting them back on it. These are the medications that I prescribe. So the first thing is I'm checking on the labs to see if they are a diabetic. This is very important. The FDA has indications for what meds. Yes, in the media, we see all the time, Ozempic, 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 but really physicians, clinicians, advanced practitioners should not be prescribing Ozempic or Monjaro unless they have a true diagnosis of diabetes. Now, if they're not a diabetic, and I'll tell you how the insurance companies and things define diabetes, then I will go for the FDA-approved medications for weight loss. The big one is Wagovi. I also have a lot of success with generic Contrave, generic Fentramine, and then generic Fentramine plus Toparamate, which is Qsimia. You can get those medications for less than $5 a month. So it's a really affordable alternative if they are denied for one of the injectable GLP-1s or GLP-1 plus GIP, which is Monjaro. Now, the first category we're going to talk about is diabetes and weight loss. So again, when to prescribe, first on the labs, you need a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5. Some of our patients will have a new diagnosis. Some of them have an existing diagnosis. Or you need to see on the glucose that it's greater than 126. So the first medication I'm going to talk about is Monjaro. And you can see that there's many different doses here that we need to scale up. So how does it work? We already heard this from Brittany. It works two different receptors. So it's not just a GLP-1 agonist. We have the GIP. And it's just kind of a miracle. It works everywhere in the body, as you can see. I feel like this is the ultimate pouch reset. When you hear patients all the time, like, I want to go back to clear liquids or full liquids, what I was on early post-op, because that's when the magic was happening with my weight loss. Well, we don't want that. I'm sure that you, your registered dietitian, doesn't want that either. But this really gives you that feeling of satiety, of fullness, almost like they did when they first went into and had surgery afterwards. It works, obviously, in a lot of mechanisms to improve insulin sensitivity, to work in the liver, in the fat stores, in the muscle. It really just works everywhere out throughout the body, and that's how it works. So how do you instruct patients to take it? I have a completely virtual practice, and I was a little bit reluctant at first to explain this, but I realized there's really great, great videos available, of course, on the manufacturers, so in this case, Eli Lilly's website. Here are some video instructions. The patients can uh, screenshot there with the QR code, and then they can give it to themselves in one of three places. So they can do it on the back of their arm. They can do it on their thigh, or my preferred location is to tell patients to take it on their abdomen. So what they do is they pop off the cap, they twist it, unlock it, put it in. They have to wait for them to hear the click. That's super important. You got to hold it for at least 10 seconds. There's nothing worse than hearing a patient said, I got jumpy. I pulled back. The medication didn't go in all the way. I don't know if it did. It was, some of it was on the floor. There was a wetness on my abdomen. Ugh, frustrating. So I make them watch the video, watch it again. Do you understand? You know how to take it before you do it. It's really easy. It's not intimidating, but I want them to feel comfortable doing that for the first time. This is really important. How do you take it? So this is the monthly dosing. So when you're prescribing it, you're going to start with Monjaro because Monjaro, if you look at the weight loss results, are the best. So they have coverage. They have diabetes. I think Monjaro is the best one to go with. So month one or four weeks, you will prescribe 2.5 milligrams weekly. You'll put days 28, not 30, 28 days no refills. Then month number two or the next four weeks, you're going to do four weeks of five milligrams. Then you do 7.5, 10, 
12.5 and then 15. Now, this is obviously a very slowly gradual increase in the amount of medication you're administering. And that is because there can be some GI side effects. So sometimes patients are like, I love this. I am on five milligrams. I am doing great. I just saw somebody for their quarterly follow-up yesterday, six months. She's down over 40 pounds. And that's another really critical thing. The post-op bariatric patients do better than those who have not had bariatric surgery. And that is because when you wake up after a bypass, after a sleep, we know these are metabolic operations. Almost immediately, those GLP-1 levels and all these incredible hormones are already going up. So if a patient was on this before surgery, saw a little success, I would revisit it after surgery and see even a more amplified synergistic response from the surgery and the medications together. I think you're going to see more weight loss. So this patient, she was like, I love five milligrams. I don't want to even tempt the side effects. I'm doing great. Let's just stay there. And we just stay there. Blood sugars are controlled. She's losing weight. She's not having side effects. Stay as low as possible. And that would be the biggest advice. How do you store it? You store it in your fridges, not your freezers. It can go 21 days without being refrigerated. And I also give them a note for them to take it through TSA so they can travel with this medication. And um, if they want to, they can just do it without having um, it refrigerated. But I want to make sure that because it's a liquid of medication, they have that note. So the side, of, the side effects are mainly GI in nature. So nausea is a big one. That's why you go slow. They might have some diarrhea or constipation. A lot of times that they go back to their protein diets, we all know this, constipation can be the real deal. Uh, it can obviously decrease your appetite. That's kind of the point. It can make you really nauseous to the point of vomiting, dry heaving. You might have a little bit of uh, reflux, and then it can cause some abdominal pain, cramping. Some people just can't take it. I try to mitigate the side effects with Zofran or something like that, but this is um, something that can potentially happen. The good thing about the side effects, though, is that if you start them on that and you get them to kind of push through, they're going to start to tolerate it more. There's a lot of great graphs that show that they'll have a peak of side effects, and then those will start to come down. So if they can push through the, the agony of it at first sometimes, and you can give them other things to get them through it, they'll do pretty well. Now, this is a big thing. You'll hear this on the news. Same thing with all the semaglutides and the GLP-1s alone is that MEN2, which is um, associated with medullary thyroid cancer, this is a big um, potential no-no. You don't want to do that. So they have a family history or a personal history of this. You want to make sure that you are not not prescribing these medications. So First and foremost, diabetes control, Monjaro is the best once you get up to that therapeutic dose. That's another key thing. Your patients will write you and say, oh, I'm on the 2.5. I only lost five pounds this month. Well, first off, you're not even therapeutic. And step away from the scale. Trust the process. It will work. You have seven more months to tear up into that 15. And you can see how the longer you go, the more you're taking, the more effective it will be in the blood sugar control. And not only that, look at the weight loss. This patient is starting at just over 200 pounds and on average, on average is losing 25 pounds, which is about 11, 12%. So some of these uh, studies, the, um, the surmount study, which is the, um, the real um, major one from Eli Lilly that was announced um, once they launched this medication was just incredibly promising and amazing. And we need to lean into those results. It won't be long before the FDA approves Monjaro for weight loss alone. And then I'm happy because it's going to give Novo some competition in terms of being the only GLP-1 approved in that space right now. So Ozempic is the other one, obviously super popular. It has three different doses that you will tear up on it. A lot of this is going to be the same because, yeah, the GLP-1 um, is also in Monjaro. So like I said, it works everywhere. There's big announcement recently about all the cardioprotective effects, about decreasing your risk of coronary artery disease, flushing out your kidneys, making you feel better, 
those those obsessive thoughts about food, all of that gets quieted down. You have a decreased appetite. It slows things down. So there is a little bit of uh, you know a thought about gastroparesis or you know even some sort of bezoar almost forming from things going slow out of the stomach. Those um, studies are are those uh, reports are infrequent, but it's something to consider. And then of course all of the work in the whole metabolism of the sugar that you ingest and how all of that works as well. So how do you take it? This one is not a single use pen. This one can be used multiple times. And so they have to put the needle on themselves. So this is the one that they're going to see the needle. It is the size of two adult hairs. You have to put it on. They're going to give you a, a, a container, a sharps container. And it's super important. That's why I underline this in pink here to make sure the patient knows they have to prime it to the flow check symbol. They have to look for this and then they dial it up. So they're going to get the same exact applicator for the first month, which is 0.25, and for the second month, which is 0.5. So they have to dial it up to their dose. Again, arm, thigh, abdomen, do the abdomen. They put it there. They firmly hold it. I say count for 20 seconds. I mean, don't move, like keep it in there. And then as you can see, this is the actual size of the needle, very, very tiny. And then they can put it in the sharps container after that. So this is the dosing, like I said, it's the same red label pen for that first two months. Month number three is one milligram. And then finally, month number four and beyond is two milligrams. Now, Ozempic generic is called semaglutide. Wagovi generic is semaglutide. Ozempic and Wagovi are the same drug. And the first three doses, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 1.0 are identical for both. It's just a rebranding and different indications per the FDA. So that's the difference. I tell my patients to take advantage of some of the resources on the Nova Nordisk website. I think they're pretty cool. I like this one. You can text exactly when you want to remember to do it. There's some anecdotal thoughts that it should be done on a Thursday so that through the weekend, you'll have the most effect of the medication when you need it most, when we're more likely to be a little uninhibited with our eating and drinking and fun and all those things. This can keep you in check during that time as well. So again, first month, it doesn't matter if you take it with or without food, you'll dial it up, you'll give it to yourself, and the half-life of it is two weeks, but you'll slowly start to go up. You'll keep it refrigerated, you can travel with it, I give notes, all of the side effects are the same, you have to worry about hypoglycemia as well, and if they're on other diabetes medications, I have a really great chart that can help you, or you can just refer them back to their endocrinologist or their primary care, whoever monitors and treats their diabetes to say, all right, we got a decrease on this if we're going to put you on Ozempic. And a lot of times the insurance companies, when you're doing the prior auth, they're going to want to see that they've tried metformin first and they failed on it. They couldn't tolerate the side effects. They want more. They have obesity as an indication as well. So with those things, you um, would probably just stop the metformin altogether. So there's different things you have to consider. And of course, hypoglycemia, some shakiness, lightheaded, weak, I don't feel well, and we don't when our blood sugars are dropping. Same thing, medullary thyroid cancer, MEN2. And of course, you got to be very careful about the other medications that can cause hypoglycemia. And then also, of course, the potential delay for gastric emptying, which could even maybe do a little bit of malabsorption, which I think that our surgeries were kind of used to navigating that sort of thing. So yes, it has great diabetes results. It says the majority of patients will have a controlled hemoglobin A1C less than 7% and can be really great maintenance. Weight loss results are great. This patient had a baseline of 220 and they lost 14 pounds on, on, on Ozempic. I'm seeing way higher. I see a little lower. This is an average, but for the most part, just like with the Monjaro, our patients post-bariatrics are doing even better. And now we're going to switch to the weight loss medications. So the first one is Wagovi. And like I said, it's also semaglutide. It's exactly the same thing. So I do start with Ozempic because if they have true diabetes, you prescribe Ozempic, their employer who opts into their medication coverage is probably more likely to cover the Ozempic. So I want to give them a good try. And these payers now are just getting so strict, as we know, with the supply chain issues, which is the most frustrating thing. And we're seeing a lot of these um 
payers wanting you to prove they have diabetes, so you have to support it with clinical documentation, your notes, very thorough evaluation. You need to show their history on these meds, the labs. That's why I have them before I even prescribe. And then if you start with Wagovi and try to go back to Ozempic, they think it's shady. So you want to start with they have diabetes, treat the diabetes with that. So like Brittany already mentioned, who gets it? 27 to 29.9 with comorbidities, greater than 30, regardless of comorbidities, you can have it. Or those who have previously had bariatric surgery, it's a chronic disease, so we can continue to treat it. Works the same because it's the same med. The pen training, I love the Wagobi pen. It's a single time use. I think it's the easiest one to use. And you got to, once you, once you uh, commit, you got to wait till you hear the click. And that's the important thing. So this is the 2.4. You want to look at the indicator. You take off the cap. There's no needle exposed. You put it firmly against your abdomen and you go for it. You want to take it the same time each week. If you miss two days or more, you wait to the next week. You skip that week and then you get back on track. If you want to stay on Thursday dosing, then you just skip that week. So this is how this is dosed. You start with 0.25, then you go to 0.5 and 1, same as Ozempic. Ozempic then stops at 2, but the Wagovi goes to 1.7, and then 2.4 is the maintenance. I mean, how ridiculous, 0.4 more. And there you go. You got it for obesity coverage, 2 versus 2.4. You hold it and refrigerate it, same side effects, GI in nature, hypoglycemia, avoid it with MEN, all that's the same, same drug interactions and all of that. The weight loss results, that little bit of 2.4 is shown even more. And look at this, one in three adults will lose 46 pounds on average if you're starting at 232. So I send this presentation to my patients and I will have them click here. It takes them to the Nova Nordisk website. They can put in their starting weight and then you can go over 5% loss, 10% loss, 15% loss, and you can have a good idea of that as well. So I call it into their local pharmacy. As you know, the supply chain issues, as I've already mentioned, are horrible. You want to make sure that their local pharmacy is applying this coupon. If they apply the coupon and they have they want Wagovi, they can do a self-pay. The lowest, most discounted rate that you can get it is for $831 a month. I don't believe that compounding these medications is appropriate. It's not FDA indicated. We don't know what's in there. I don't do it. I don't practice that way. I don't have that available. I only do these specific medications because... That is what is safe. Now, they don't have diabetes. They don't have coverage for Wagovi. They don't want to pay $831 a month. Now what? Well, then I will switch to the generic component of naltrexone plus bupropion, which is Contrave. So how it works, it works a lot in that reward center in the brain. So it really helps with those intense cravings, that urge to eat, that snacking late at night. Should I eat? Should I do the chips, the pretzels, the popcorn? Should I do it? Should I not? I'm doing it. I'm guilty, all of that. And it also big time helps if, you're, if the patients are getting some of their calories from, the, from liquids like alcohol, especially. So it breaks this eating cycle. I'm upset. I'm emotional. Screw it. I'm going to eat. I start eating. I feel like I can't stop. I'm powerless. I keep going. Oh gosh, why did I do that? And I keep on going. It really helps with that. And, and patients are saying it has really changed them. So I don't think we should underestimate these meds. I know this talk is about GLP and GLP-1s uh, and GIPs, but I think that Contrave is a great alternative. The side effects, just like the others, are GI, big time, especially the naltrexone. You got to really go really, really low when you're starting this one. So the contraindications, of course, naltrexone is Narcan. That is the antidote to opioids. So if they're already on Percocet, something like that, you can't use it as well. If they have seizures, uncontrolled high blood pressure, it, the bupropion can also give patients, have told me, it makes them feel like their heart is racing. Some, some tachycardia and a little bit of palpitations. So slower dose, but it's just over a one month titration. So if you actually prescribe the brand name, which is eight milligrams of naltrexone, 90 milligrams total of each tablet of the bupropion, you see how you ultimately will go up to 32 milligrams of naltrexone. And then you're going to do 360 milligrams of the bupropion is when you take it in a simple pill. 
Well, this is how I prescribe it. And yeah, they got to do a little work with the pill cutting and all of that. But again, it's less than five bucks a month. They can use good RX. So now Trexome, it comes only in 50s. Do not let them take a 50. Remember, they're starting with eight milligrams. So I tell them all caps, explanation points, start slow, read this. Make sure you understand. Do not take a 50. Break it into a quarter and then try to break it again. Try to do a half. It's going to be really, really tiny. It's easy to break it into quarters because it's fairly big, but it's hard to get it that eighth. So I tell them, try to do an eighth for two weeks. Then try to do a quarter after that. If you tolerate it, stay there. If you feel like you need a little bit more and you have no side effects, go up to a half, 25 milligrams a day, which is pretty much where they're at with the, um, the actual brand name. Bupropion, it's 150 for the first two weeks and then 150 BID. The maximum dose of bupropion alone, if you're treating it for something like depression, is 450 milligrams in a day. And then it works. Here we go. We have some weight loss results. You lose some inches. Um, they can go on the website and figure that out. Fentramine, oh, fentramine, it's gotten such a bad rap. I really think though it's pretty good. Yes, it was part of Fen Fen. Yes, it has a lot of side effects, but you can get around that very easily. So how it works, it works multiple places in the brain to really give you inhibition. It gives you that satiety, that pouch reset, that reward um, type of sensation. The dosing. I do it a little bit different. And I actually learned this from Teresa Lamaster. She said, listen, this is a small thing. So it's hard to break it up. But you can start, you can even do acid effects, you can do lower dose, but I like to start with this tablet and let them go up. I said, listen, trust me, do a quarter of a tablet. It's really hard to break it up, but just do a little bit. Stay on that for the first month. Take it about 12 hours before you're going to go to bed because it is going to make you stay up. It is a sympathomyometic amine, meaning it triggers that fight or flight response. So if you're running in the woods with a bear chasing you, you're going to have those side effects, dry mouth heart is racing. I can't think about food because I'm manic right now, you know, that kind of feeling. And therefore I can't sleep. So insomnia can be a real thing. And you can also get constipation or maybe diarrhea. You can have um, erectile issues or you might have an increase in sex drive. So it all works in the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, it's mimicking the sympathetic um, go, go, go feeling. So after a month, no side effects, not happy with the weight loss, which no one ever is, then they can auto trade trade up to half a tab. Month number two, if they're doing great, it's down a half. If not, go up to the full tab and you can stay there as well. So here are the side effects like we talked about, tachycardia, blood pressure. You really need to get a good baseline. Also contraindication, a patient who is pregnant or trying to become pregnant, eh, you got to make sure that you don't have that. So pregnancy, breastfeeding, if they're on MAOIs, nardil, parmate, anxiety disorder. This is a controlled substance, a DEA class four controlled substance. You have to use your DEA to prescribe it. And that is because it has an addictive potential to it. So, and even abuse potential. So you want to make sure that they don't have any history of drug abuse, glaucoma, anxiety, hyperthyroidism, uncontrolled high blood pressure. If they have high blood pressure, which is controlled with medications, they can stay on it. They could get a hypertensive crisis that they do in MAOI, big deal. If they are in alcohol abuse situation, you don't want to do that as well. Insulin, it can really work with that. So you've got to be careful that they don't drop too low and other drugs that have that anergic uh, type of effect. And then finally, if you're not losing weight, you want to add to paramate. I never start with Qsimia. Never. You start low with Ventramine alone. Then I might add the toparamate to it. It does pretty much the same thing. There's a little bit of that neurotransmitter GABA effect as well that will continue to help. This is the brand name dosing increase. I would just add on the generic toparamate as well. You'll see the weight loss results and it still works, you know, so it's not a bad alternative. I've had patients lose lots of weight and do really well. I do believe that after bariatric surgery, you're going to even do better on Contrave, on Fentramine and on Cusimia, just like you do the injectables. So same sort of contraindications and side effects and the same drug interactions and warnings. So the program is really important. As Brittany said, you got to do a thorough and an extensive evaluation. You got to look at all of their medications and determine which ones cause you to gain weight. And here's a list of ones that might be a great alternative or even something that it can help you to lose weight. Now, some of these medications, maybe they need to be on Remeron, let's say, and they don't have a good one that treats their depression like that. 
don't change it to potentially lose weight. But if they're like, oh, I don't even know, is that effective? Give them these lists of ones that are more weight neutral or even weight loss. Diabetes, obviously insulin's terrible. The more insulin, the more weight, the more weight, the more insulin. Ugh, that's why you want to try to get them off of that. Obviously, surgery is incredible at helping to decrease or even improve or resolve their diabetes, but you want to go there as well. Also high blood pressure beta blockers. Carvedilol is the best one that's more weight neutral. Seizures, sometimes they're on neurotin for other issues, things like that. Psych meds, even antihistamines, the best one is Claritin if you're going over the counter and trying to see which one's the most weight neutral. Contraception, I don't care what anybody says. Injections like Depo-Provera, progesterone only always cause weight gain. And you're going to hear women all the time said, when I went on Depo, that's when it went downhill for me. So oral contraceptives by mouth, especially ones containing estrogen are more um, weight neutral. Sleep is important as I started with, but sometimes those sleeping aids like Ambien can cause you to weight, gain weight. So a more um, weight neutral alternative is a more natural thing like melatonin. Start low there as well. So how do you make this program comprehensive and you don't cut corners and you do it right? So this is how you do it. First off, you have a great support group. I have one on Facebook and I also meet with the patients every month. I just had a really intimate discussion with them last night. We talked about sugar addiction and people got really raw and vulnerable. We also have every week available my registered dietitian, Hannah Schuyler. She's a superstar. Every Friday at noon, she will do a Zoom where they can just hop on, Q&A, accountability, you need tips and tricks, or even they learn from each other and get support um, to those sessions. The third Wednesday of every month, we do a um, live interactive support group on Zoom. We'll get a lot of patients who will come to those. Next month is surviving the holidays, Thanksgiving with your tiny pouch. We have a success guide that's really comprehensive. It has a lot about the diet and the things that they need to do. We go over just a simple plate method. I don't want to overcomplicate this. I want them to sustain on this for the rest of their lives. We encourage exercise, but just get started. Sometimes they're just not ready for that yet, and that is okay too. And then if they want to monitor themselves, there's lots of different apps. They can even do a whole, um, old school just journaling, writing, write what you put in your mouth. Hannah can meet with you and review it. We talk a lot about the different interactions with sleep. We have customized meal plans that really um, tell the patients based on their preferences of what they like and what they don't like. And then we give them the ingredients, the shopping list, the recipes, what to do with the leftovers, how to eat each meal, how do you break it down by macros in terms of proteins, of fats, of carbs, and make sure that it meets their macro profile of what they want to do. People love to know and they love it to be personalized. So I think it's super important. We tell them to do therapy services. We partner with um, multiple people in the area and also nationally through some digital ones. We give them all medical alert cards that they can take to places like Fogo to Child that will recognize that they're on a medication that causes them to eat less. So will you recognize this and not charge them as much? We have a podcast. We talk a lot about this. We did a six-part series on medical weight loss so that our patients were really well informed. We have episode guides, blogs, information, lots of different things. And then we have them meet with us on our Hilo patient portal. We have a questionnaire that's 160 questions. And I feel like there's no stone left unturned for these patients um, and the insurance company. If you want to reach out to me and speak to me, I'm on Instagram, Dr. Dovec, D-R-D-O-V-E-C. Follow me, I'll follow back. My website, Body by Bariatrics, look at it, take it. I want, I, my, my goal is to popularize bariatric surgery, popularize obesity in these comprehensive methods. That's my cell. Please text me, call me, or feel free to email me as well. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm going to open it up to the floor and to my um, colleagues here for some Q&A. Thanks, Dr. Dovek. Excellent talks from both Brittany and Dr. Dovek. Much appreciated. I am going to start tackling some of our questions. I encourage all of our attendees, keep the questions going. We have some time um, and we have a few interesting ones here. So um, I am going to start with uh, what are your recommendations regarding holding medications prior to surgery? I know a lot of people, there's a lot of talk about this um, in, in the literature and the media, a lot of question regarding surgery. So let's start with preoperative. Um, what are your recommendations regarding holding? Um, I'm assuming this is all of the medications, the injectables, as well as um, the PO, anti-obesity meds. So, oh, go ahead, Brittany. 
Okay. So for our clinic, what we are doing right now is we're just holding medications for two weeks. Um, our anesthesia has come back and said that they want them to be held at least one week. I have seen recommendations for as long as four weeks. So I said, let's split the difference and go with two. And that's using for all PO and for injectables. The PO medications can have effects with anesthesia. We don't want those things to happen. We have gone through this whole entire process to get these patients optimized for bariatric surgery. Why at the finish line would we do something to potentially make that not happen? Yeah. And I always, before, you know, anesthesia and this became, this question became very important and anesthesia kind of took that stance of holding these injectables for at least two weeks. Previously, I would say two days, like stop your metformin two days before surgery, your glipizide, glipurize, sulfonylureas, metformin, or even the injectables, which are weekly doses. Sexenda is daily, but the weekly ones, I would say, don't, just make sure you don't take it within two days if your weekly doses, you know, whenever. But now, just like Brittany, yeah, we are um, we are being told that, oh my goodness, we don't want them to be canceled. So the injectables you got to hold for two weeks, and the fentramine has always been another one that we have them hold for two weeks. We've always done that um, because it can interact with the anesthesia as well. Another interesting question regarding smoking and smoking cessation. Have you tried um, GLP-1s uh, for patients who need to quit smoking uh, to avoid weight increase associated with smoking cessation? I have not. Um, I would assume that contrary would probably be a great option for smoking cessation because of the bupropion that we have also used in smoking cessation outside of bariatric surgery. Um, I think that's a great, interesting question and probably something that needs to be studied. I think that's an awesome question too. Yeah, I have not um I have not done that. I do previous to even, you know, trying to get them to lose some weight. I've done well butrin for those struggling. I make them check their urine nicotine metabolites to make sure that they are nicotine free. Um, and then we keep them on the well butrin sometimes. But I think adding a little bit of the naltrexone is um I think more effective than doing a whole different type of medication. We have a question about coverage. So a uh, patient is placed on uh, uh, Manjaro, uh, loses weight, goes back for follow-up, and uh, an elevated A1C now is normal. Uh, will the patient lose coverage for the medication is the first part of the question. I would assume not because obesity is a chronic disease. and. Like hypertension, if we stop our blood pressure medications, what is our blood pressure going to do? Go up. What's going to happen if we stop these medications? So far indicates that your weight may go back up. And that's one of the things that I caution patients on before we even go on to these medications. Perfectly said. A lot of buzz in the media about gastroparesis with the GLPs. Have you seen it in your practice? What's your experience with that? Well, you take that one, Dr. David. So I have, um, I have not seen it personally in my patients, but I do know someone who was saying she's having a lot of issues and she had a, just this, that bezoar I was talking about. Um, she had it. I saw the, the EGD pics of it. Um, and she was doing really well with her weight loss. But like I said, I think these are just reports. I haven't seen it. I've done a lot of medical weight loss, hundreds of patients and, um, I haven't seen it to that degree personally. I would say the only thing that I have heard is um, why anesthesia is so up in arms about mm -hmm. these medications because of the gastroparesis and saying that they have seen bezoars or excess food upon, you know, patients being, you know, 28 uh, hours, at least NPO. That would be the only thing that I've seen and that may be contributing to it, but no, I haven't seen it in practice yet. Um, so this is a little bit of a long question. Uh, compliance with preoperative dietary modifications are considered vital to setting patients up for post-op success. How can pre-op medical weight loss be incorporated in a way such, a, such that it maximizes benefit without becoming a confounder with weight loss as a surrogate? In other words, how to ensure we don't falsely portray successful preoperative changes when they're a result of the medications? I mean, this is it. This is the controversial thing for us as a society that like volumes are down. Great. I'm in competition. I'm trying to make it better for surgery. I'm doing so great. I'm out of here. And it's 
it's a tough one. You know, you obviously want to always first and foremost do right by your patients and give them all their options and, and that sort of thing. But what I have found is you're just prolonging the inevitable. So I don't, I don't prescribe it too often before surgery. Now, I also think that some patients might come into your program not quite ready for surgery. And obviously that can be a feeder. And I have converted a lot of people who have been on it for months. And it's like, you know what, I'm now ready for surgery because I can say that I gave this the best try I could. And I do think that that's why we might see a little bit of a lull in the bariatric surgery numbers. But like Brittany showed in that one slide, there is nothing that's going to replicate the success and the efficacy of bariatric surgery. So right now we might see it, but it's just because I do believe that people want to say that they try their best and then they'll give themselves permission. So we might see a dip, but we're going to see it come around. And that's why it's important to embrace it in your practice so that um, you, you, you just offer it. But I don't want to waste their time. And it's a lot with the prior OS and all the frustration and supply chain. And, and if they're ready for surgery, we just go for it. I agree. Along those lines, there's a question um, specifically, have you experienced patients canceling surgery because of their success with Manjaro or some of the anti-obesity medications? I think we have one. That's yeah, it. it's not, it's, it's, it's not that frequent, but sometimes you'll get it and it's, you know, you're happy and all of that, but it's like, huh. I've been working with you and, and you and like I said, you wonder if they're gonna come back around. So it's a it's a double-edged sword. It's you hope they do, you hope they maintain it, obviously. But um, you know, when their BMIs are 40, 50, 60, and they want to try a medication, it is like no, no. You might lose a little bit, but you what you need to lose to be in that healthier, sustainable, durable result is not gonna be accomplished typically, at least on statistically speaking, on paper with a medication. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, but yeah, numbers are down nationally guys. And um, yeah, it's tough. I, I do want to add that. I think we, we see that the higher BMIs actually kind of come in and say, Hey, I want to start a medication first. And I, I always caution and give them the, all right, well, this is the medication that we can start with. The tri what I uh, am utilizing is TRICARE because we are a military system and they're pretty strict with how we go through it. We have to do phenamine, uh, Qsimia, Contrave, then we get to the GLPs, which is obnoxious to say the least. And I try to find loopholes, but get denied constantly, write 20 page long letters and get denied. Regardless of that happening, I'll still say, hey, we can certainly try something like this. We can do whatever we can. I can you know, get some uh, other help in, but I think you're going to lose only 22%. This is what your BMI may come down to. And this is if you are really compliant with diet, you're doing a great job with exercise, you're not stressed out, you're sleeping perfectly, you basically don't have a life and can be a, a cool bodybuilder, which I can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. so it's pretty challenging. And, you know, I, I don't see that it's going to actually get in the way. I think it may delay, but I, I think that people are going to come back around. And if we start, you know, paying attention, like, okay, this person came in a year ago, decided not to do this. Oh, it's two years later. Hey, they're coming back. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, uh, Dr. Dovic, I think you touched upon some of this, but um, we have an attendee asking your process for both of you for insurance verification on coverage for AOMs. Um, do you have specific recommendations in terms of improving the amount of time and resource utilization as, uh, as well as patient instructions to support it? I do. You... I'm, I'm going to take this one. Um, and this is this is why a lot of us don't even want to do this. Some of you on this call are like, I know I should do it. I don't want to do this. And that's why the PCPs aren't doing it. First off, you're a little intimidated. You don't want to do the wrong thing. But also you're like, oh, I can't take on a more administrative burden. And also just getting people to surgery. My God, the prior OS and that process alone is a lot. So with that being said, there, I'm going to try to simplify this as best as we have. And we have, we're getting much better because if you see 20 people, you got to deal with 20 prior auths. So there's a website, cover my meds, cover my meds.com. Go on there. I was like, all right, I'm going to lean in. I'm going to figure out exactly how to get a prior auth. I'm like, oh, it's pretty easy. They ask pretty much the same questions. Then once you get past the thing, they're going to ask for more documentation. You just upload it, submit it. Sometimes you'll instantaneously get that approval and it's great. Other times it's going to take more. Now I don't, 
do it personally. I do have someone that that helps and, and keeps track of the cover of my meds. Okay, it came back. They ask more questions. We'll answer them. It comes back. It's denied. Let's do an appeal. Here's the appeal process. You can submit that electronically through cover my meds. It's not that big of a deal. You should look at it. It's like five questions and it's pretty quick if you just do it right then and there or have somebody that does it in your office. The appeal letters, we have templates. It sounds like Brittany has a, a, a doozy. If she has a 10 pager, I'm like, send me that bad boy because I need to keep that on my files. Um, and I have, I have one too. I'm happy to share it with you guys. And a lot of times if they have an exclusion to meds, just like with surgery, you're not going to get coverage and you kind of just move on. And then another thing I'm going to give a plug to um, a service that I use is called Boost Bariatrics. It is a system that is um, you for the patient's intents and purposes, it looks like we are texting them. So you're texting them. And then you have them in these little buckets. So we have our whole medical weight loss pipeline in a bucket. So they'll get started. We say submit prior authorization. And then when they go into the, the next one, it'll say, congratulations, you've been approved for Wagovi. So it automates the messages, the emails, you've been denied. These are your next two options. How do you want to proceed? So then that way, we're really slick by just moving these buckets and then they get these automations and it takes a little bit to build it. But once you do, I mean, I'm just thrilled to death with it. And um, it, it helps a lot with that process and communicating with the patient because they get frustrated. I haven't heard from you. I'm calling my pharmacy. I don't know um, what the status of the prior auth is. And then the minute you prescribe a med electronically, that will initiate that, that, that process in Cover My Meds as well. One other quick thing is you can team up with some pharmacies in your area, like these little boutique pharmacies. There's one in Florida, it's called Colonial Drugs. They'll ship to anywhere in Florida for free. And then if you prescribe to them, they will take on the entire prior auth for you. So I, I used to be in Maryland. I see some of my old partners in Maryland. Hello, guys. I called every because I still have a lot of patients that do medical weight loss in Maryland. And if Tim and Shauna, you guys want to do it up there, that'd be awesome. But I called a lot of pharmacies in Maryland to try to have someone do the same deal that we do down here in Florida. So you can get creative that way, too. And your Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly reps will help you. The more they sell, the happier they are. So they'll they'll help you navigate that as well. We have a couple of questions. Thank you for that. That was excellent. Um, a couple of questions, comments about um, being telehealth virtual with uh, blood pressure with Fentermine. I don't do any telehealth with us, so I'm going to give that one to you. Okay, so yes, I do telehealth with Fentramine, and I, when I was in Baltimore, I only did Fentramine. This was before Wagovi was even on the picture in Manjaro, and um, and they and they did that. So. If I want them to have a baseline blood pressure and pulse, so I will tell them, have you been to your PCP recently? Especially if they're on medications for it, I need to have that baseline number. In addition, I say, do you have a home monitor? If not, get one. I think that they're, they're cheap. You could even get it covered by insurance or even go to your local Walmart and put your arm in the thing and um, regularly check it. I also want them to be very, really just conscientious of those potential side effects as the, the scariest ones. And I want to make sure that if they feel that, that they're checking it and they're communicating that with me too. And again, they can text it to me. So it's, I think that's a key to success is making sure that they have questions or issues that they can tell us and we respond very, very quickly to those concerns. While we're on Fentramine, we have a pretty specific question, but I actually have heard um, this issue from people as well. Uh, Ohio uh, can't prescribe Fentramine beyond three months if the patient doesn't achieve 5% weight loss. Um, in this case, would you use a quarter of a tab? We don't see much weight loss with even half a tab. Be concerned about that, especially for patients with a higher weight who need to lose more to reach that 5% threshold. So in general, have you seen that with the three months and, and how have you handled that? Okay. Now it's not just Ohio, it's everywhere that you, that it's not FDA approved for a great more than three months, unless there are clinical guidelines for the safe long-term use of fentramine if you document certain things. So I, you can Google it if you want, you can send it, you can send, uh, you can ask me and I'll send it to you. There's 12 things that you need to make sure that um, you say and you document. And then I just keep going. I don't stop it after three months because fentramine is the biggest offender of the minute you stop it, you're back. And it's, it's, it's hard to watch that. So I actually think that you can push that through. 
Uh, going back to the injectables, how soon do you restart GLP-1s post-op? What are your markers, whether they have diabetes or not? Um, second part of a question, have you seen slower than usual weight loss after sleeve if they took a GLP-1 prior to surgery? So first, can we talk about restarting? Uh, I've heard everything as much as uh, one month to two months after. I kind of err on the side of caution and go two months after. I don't want to get someone into a hypoglycemic episode, even though I know that they don't technically cause hypoglycemia. But when we're going through the diet progression, and some people don't progress as well as others and also don't tell me if they're not progressing as well as maybe they should be because they feel ashamed or they're embarrassed or they feel like they should be doing better than they actually are, all those kind of things that go into play. I just say, let's just wait. Let's see how we're doing. And typically that weight loss is pretty substantial in the first couple of months anyways. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough because we know that diabetes type two, um, that's why they're on it for that is improved or even resolved right after surgery and they walk out on none of their medications. So I actually stop all of those and I continue to hold them and I have them check their blood sugars and you know, just like Brittany said, if they have three consecutive readings greater than 150, then at that point, um, you know, we might talk about putting it on. But I actually post op, I really do throw the ball back into the endocrinologist um, or the PCP's um, kind of court on that one. So I don't do it now after surgery. Um, I think that we really need to 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 put out there as ASMBS. A true, and I know that on the MBSAQIP, there's a calculator that you can see that, okay, if I had a sleeve and I started at this weight, where could I be if I put in all these things? I think we need to have a bell curve that's really easy for us all to see that says, okay, this is how much weight you should have lost, but this is where you are. And if you continue to be under, we intervene earlier and get them back on where they should be on the curve. And I think that when we're looking at our insurance colleagues, the employers, those who are like reluctant to even invest in surgery, oh, they just gain it back. Well, no, we are being proactive to making sure that we intervene early to protect that investment that you have put into surgery by putting these medications onto the scene earlier. So I don't have that yet. And I've always wanted to do that, but you guys are really great with it. Like we need to do that. And then we can all say it's, it takes the thinking out of it. This is our algorithm. They're here. We're going to put it in and um, go for it. And then hopefully the insurance companies will take the bait because they see that. Yeah. Like I'm going to cover this um, medication because I don't want to lose the 20, 30, 40, 50,000 that I've invested in that surgical procedure. Dr. Dovek, um, Switching gears just for a second, uh, they're asking, since uh, medical weight loss takes so much time and resource, when or how do you have time to operate? I only do it one day a month. That's you operate it. one day a month? No, no, I only do medical weight loss one day a month. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's a lot because in the follow-ups and all of that sort of thing. So, and it compounds on itself. So you do the year, then the next time I'm doing three months, then six months and three months, six months. It's like, oh God, there's so, so many follow-ups. I need a... I need a physician assistant, Brittany. I mean, you want to come to the Sunshine State, baby? Let's go. I mean, <laughs> you're pretty impressive. But I, um, no, I only do it once a month. And actually, because we're gearing up for the end of the year, like mega rush, I'm, I did my last um, one yesterday, and I'm not um, doing any more medical weight loss new patients until January. So, I do space it out. But um, yeah, my partner, um, Dr. Diana Lane, is on this call and. God love her. She ought to help me with this thing a lot too. <laughs> um, what do you consider a weight loss, uh, sorry, a weight plateau post-op um, when you consider restarting or starting an AOM after surgery? I actually just dealt with this in clinic today. <laughs> I had a patient who is six months post-op sleeve and she has only lost 18% of her excess body weight. And I'm sitting here thinking, I said, that's just not enough. We went through everything. She's doing all the things she can. At that point, I'm like, we got to start something. We got to go somewhere. And since I'm on track here, we have to start with pentamine. So I'm like, hey, here's the risk. This is everything we talked about. And, you know, I'm going to give her, she's also on a lot of psych medication. So I printed her out a little pamphlet that's like, here's what serotonin syndrome is. Please look out for these things. Make sure these things aren't happening. If they are, stop the medication, call me. Let's go from there. Um, as far as other plateaus, I don't typically see them until after a year um, from surgery. This is a pretty unusual case for our practice. Um, but if it's after a year and they really haven't budged, or maybe it's like 
10 pounds here and there, that's when I start or I restart a medication or I start a new medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I I haven't started it within six months. I just, I haven't. And plateaus are, I mean, we know how that set point is and they'll lose 15 pounds the first day and then they don't lose anything the next three and a half weeks and they're frustrating or whatever's happening. But your body is just, is, we know it's stepwise loss. Plateaus are absolutely 100% guaranteed to happen. So, you know, you wait, but like she said, if it's, if, if they're again, way under where they should be in the bell curve, then at around six months, we could potentially, but usually it doesn't happen until about a year. Um, and I think sometimes that just helps them to just keep on going, especially after the sleeve. After the sleeve, I think you got to be a little bit more aggressive because the weight loss is potentially not going to be as much. And then sometimes, you know, you end up revising a sleeve to a gastric bypass if they're having reflux or weight regain and the medications even aren't helping too. Along those lines, if you have a patient with a much higher BMI, let's just say above 50, um, would you consider resuming uh, AOM sooner post-op and not necessarily wait um, till that, you know, six months or a year? Or um, do you have different considerations when somebody has um, uh, a much higher BMI? I think we're getting to like a super, super obese, like 70, 80 BMI. We, we need to start them immediately after they're not, even with bariatric surgery, they're probably not going to hit that BMI. That's a healthy weight for them uh, and improve those comorbid conditions. They may or get rid of them, resolve them. Let's go with that. It may improve quite drastically. They may come off of many medications. They may decrease medications. But I think at, when you're at those very high BMIs that you probably need to start those sooner. Um, like Dr. Dovic said, I sometimes pump that back to primary care and endocrinology, especially if it's something that's going to affect blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's tough. I, I don't have... Um a really, again, I don't have a systematic approach to that yet. And I need to, and I need to have more or more of an objective way of looking at that. Um, but yeah, I think that I would start them sooner because you, you know, in the beginning, you got to maximize every day in the beginning, you got to really get the most out of it because every day that goes further, it gets harder. And so I, I think that that is very important to maybe resume those um, changing gears a bit, um, I believe this was um, your slide with pre-op um, blood work. Why an insulin level versus a C peptide? I have gotten approval. Granted, it is not now they're cracking down and all of that on hyperinsulinemia without a, uh, a significant rise over 6.5 of the hemoglobin A1C or a blood sugar greater than 126. With hyperinsulinemia, you can see, you know, up oh, there's like 50, 60, 70 on um, their value. And you're like, they're getting diabetes. Let's intervene early. And I've got an approval with that lab result. I love that you do that. That's fantastic. We have a specific question about Contrave. Uh, when you're prescribing for a patient who is getting liquid calories via alcohol. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Um, how are you counseling patients regarding their impact, uh, the impact of that on seizure threshold? Um, and also a question, have you tried uh, having patients dissolve naltrexone tab in 50 mLs of water to get a one-to-one -one dilution so you can have them use a more exact dose of naltrexone? I'm gonna let you start with that one. Wow, I mean that sounds pretty. Yeah, uh, no, uh, that's yeah, right? not as sophisticated. I never thought of that. Um, I haven't, I haven't done that. Um, and I just tell them that the alcohol, if you drink when you're on it, you're just gonna feel really nauseous and that I think is a good thing. I haven't really gone too much into the seizure thing with the alcoholism. So I haven't done much, much counseling on either part of that question. I haven't considered dissolving it or, or doing that, that kind of counseling, but I mean, I'm going to change my practice based on your feedback. So thank you guys. Um, there's a lot here. On support groups, do you mix surgical and non-surgical patients or do you just have medical weight loss patients alone? I definitely mix. And I think it's super important for the medical weight loss patients to see the surgical patients. It's like mixing a waiting room, like, 
look at them. They're happy. They're dancing. They're like really thin. And, it, you know, just to see like, these are your results. These are your, your, your possibilities, your considerations. Cause everyone's kind of checking out the other one and, you know, you might need it before you might need it after it might be the gateway to get into surgery. So I, I have the mix. Now, the one thing is that one um, hour accountability session that we have on Fridays at noon, that's exclusive to medical weight loss because it's going to be about the medications and that sort of thing. But the other side of the other support group on Facebook and then the group sessions, nope, we all come together because it's all the same. The sugar addiction, you know, being vulnerable, the way you feel, all those kinds of things I think that need support are all the same foundational issues. Yeah. And on that, I love to mix my preoperative and postoperative patients together because there is so much crosstalk on what can I expect? Or this was my experience, but this could be this person's experience. And there's a lot of of information there for patients to learn from one another. And sometimes they're too shy to ask and it's like a a Facebook and we aren't, we don't have a Facebook because it's military. Again, we have Mm. some people to play by. I hate it when I see TRICARE and that's what you see every time. I'm like, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, quickly, Dr. Dovek, name of your pharmacy again, that you referred to in Florida. Colonial Drugstore. Just Google Colonial Drugstore. They're actually located in Winter Park, but they'll go everywhere across Florida. They do not ship fentramine and they do not ship anything across state lines. Uh, question. For those without texting abilities, they're unable to text with patients. What kind of follow-up do you have after a patient starts a med? What do you do, Brittany? I mean, we have texting. So what do you guys, how do you guys kind of follow up to make sure that they're okay? Um, so, I mean, I see them every four weeks for the first three months, at least that's pretty standard. I think across the board for people who are doing, uh, weight loss medications. Um, if they're having a problem, we do have the, um, our, our system Genesis, uh, our Cerner, as some of you may know, they, we have the ability to have uh, messaging between patients, providers, patients, and clinics. So if they're having issues and they want, can't call us, which please just call us is what I always say if they have a problem, or even walk into the clinic and fill out a form that says, I'm having this problem if they're right there. And most of our patients are pretty close. Um, so we aren't doing too many people who are far away. Uh, other than that, I see them at four weeks and if they're like, Hey, I tried the medication, I hated it. And I stopped it. I'm like, alrighty. So we'll figure something else out. Thank you for doing that because you did the right thing. <laughs> if that's not for you, it's not for you. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we have a question about, um, quote unquote conversion rate, um, of what have you seen of, uh, the patients who have started, a medication, they're a medical weight loss patient, but they do progress on to becoming a surgical patient. So I think this question is they're entering a medical weight loss program. And what are you seeing in terms of the patients who will go on to have surgery? So we don't actually have a medical weight loss program. If we do start someone on a medication prior to surgery, it's because they are absolutely going to have surgery and they're not going to just do medication. I, it is only me prescribing medications in our practice. So I cannot keep up with that many patients. I've been trying to get a weight loss program through the hospital started because there are so many patients that need it. Um, So I can't answer that question. The conversion rate is high and you gently, you sensitively, but you continuously plant seeds. The first time you meet with them one-on-one, they, they, they see you. I, so like I said, I do a group session where I give that presentation and then I meet with them one-on-one. And that's where I say like, what is your motivations? Why are you here? You know, why do you want meds? Like, do you have questions about that? Like, where, where's your head at with that sort of thing? And then, you know, I'll look at their BMI and I'll just, you know, I'm not like, did you see your BMI? It's, have you ever, I just want to know your thoughts. Obviously I do have a lot in the presentation about bariatric surgery. So what do you think? Like, have you ever thought about that and you know what what are your hesitancies about it and just sort of get to understand like your bmi is 45 but you know why and then okay you get it i take note of that mental note or write it down and then um when they come back in three months if they're doing great okay great if if they're not quite where they are um, what do you think about surgery i do get a lot of sleeve to bypass revisions from 
the medical weight loss program. And I've gotten a couple of regular, just first time, um, you know, forget this, I'm going, but I haven't, I've only, I opened my practice in April of 2023. So I've been doing this for over a decade, but I just started in private practice. So I don't think I've had enough runway in terms of time to be able to really see that true conversion of medical to surgical patients. Yeah, I think that's still evolving, especially with the exponential growth of the injectables. Um, so we did talk about restarting the injectables post-op, but there's specifically a question when you restart, are you starting again at the lowest dose or, mm -hmm. or how are you dosing them post No, uh, when you restart them post-op? Absolutely. Because we already are at a smaller size stomach, either sleeve or bypass, and they already are going to have potentially some nausea issues that go along with food. So why would you at all put those, subject those patients to having more nausea issues, more gastrointestinal issues than they already are having? Yeah. I think if you go over two weeks without getting meds, which is the problem with the supply chain, because they'll be on 0 0.25, 0 0.5. Oh, no one can get one. And it's like, oh my gosh, you haven't had it in a couple months. I make them start over always and make them start at the low dose. You don't want to just go for it. They can get really sick. And um, I would, if it's greater than two weeks, oh, sorry, you got to go back. And this is, it's so painful right now, you guys, like, I, I don't think it's just Florida. Like I said, I see people because of virtual, I see them from all over. No one can get the meds. It's so frustrating. Even if they have that approval, can't get them. Mm -hmm. We can't get them here. You can, Brittany, you said, or you can't? No, I, I think that's, that's yeah. nationwide. I know our, our um, medical uh, weight loss director says the exact same thing. Um, any thoughts about um, the concern with gastroparesis uh, uh, caused by an injectable versus them having diabetes? Like, how do you, you know, approach a patient? Oh, that's a that's a tricky one because patients will ask me that if they already struggle with gastroparesis because of their diabetes and their length of having and all of those things, and then they're like, "Is this going to get worse?" Because that's you know one of the things. Um, I I say a council will will we'll see. We can you know follow up, but honestly, I still kind of go for it and. I, I don't know. I don't know the exact percentage. I don't know if it'll happen to you or if it won't. Um, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? Like, I, I, I don't know. A uh, question about the um, total uh, body weight loss in Manjaro studies. They're saying that they're in, quote unquote, lighter patients, I assume lower BMIs. Are the reported results transferable to patients with BMIs of 40, 50 or more? I mean, I as a percentage, I'd say, yeah. For sure. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to best handle a situation when a patient comes back saying that their PCP doesn't want them to proceed with bariatric surgery because they want them to lose weight by starting on a medication? Hmm. I haven't actually experienced this one yet, thankfully. Um, I'm going to send that one to you, Dr. Dovick. I mean, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. Oh, you don't want the bypass. You want the sleeve. And you're like, listen, I only do one thing, and this is obesity. And I do this all day, every day. And it's really you know, you have to play this very delicate dance of, yes, we respect our colleagues, but it's like, this is my one wheelhouse, you know, and I would, you know, it's, it's hard when they're not supported. They won't do the letter of support or letter of medical necessity. They won't do the preoperative clearance. They're putting negative thoughts in their head. Oh, let's try this. Okay, great. Are you willing to do the prior OS, follow up with them on a regular basis, make sure that this is appropriate, monitor for side effects, all that goes into it. Um, you know, and sometimes they will say, my PCP wants this, and then I'll flip them into the medical weight loss arm and, you know, see what we can do. But it's frustrating. And it's, and it's, again, it's a delicate dance. So if you want referrals, and you know, you, you just, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, we're coming close to the end. We've had some amazing questions. Um, does previous bariatric surgery diagnosis prevent the patient's um, getting cut from GLP-1 coverage after achieving a BMI of less than 30? No. Again, it's they a chronic are. disease. Okay. Regardless of surgery or not. 
me just check. I think um, if we have time for one more, um, I guess maybe I misinterpreted the pre-op question. Uh, the main question is, when prescribed by other providers and patients start to lose weight pre-op, should that be considered appropriate pre-op compliance? Hmm. What, uh, pre-op compliance in terms of what? I guess maybe if they need documentation. Oh, um, oh yeah. I mean, that would be better than the usual um, discussed weight told them to diet exercise, like, all right, like they're, you're actually trying to help and support. I, I would think that that would be, uh, I think that would demonstrate compliance and be good for the, the prior authorization approval for surgery. I would think that documentation would be very helpful. I agree. Yeah. We have a comment. Of course, the med is a tool the patient is using. So, um, I, uh, I, we're at the end of our time. I want to wholeheartedly thank Brittany and Dr. Dovek. We knew we, we had over 300 uh, people register for this webinar. Um, we've had over, well over a hundred tonight. Um, it's definitely a topic that everyone is interested in that uh, I think is affecting everybody's practice one way or another. And, um, you know, as somebody said in the commentary, we need more of this at our, our annual meeting. So again, thank you for your time, Dr. Dovek and Brittany. Thank you so much for all of your questions, all of the participants. I, it just helps to make it such a robust um, discussion to have your questions in the chat and the Q&A. And again, we hope to see all of you in June at the annual meeting. That's June 9th to 13th. And we're going to have content just like this. We'll have panels. Um, we have excellent courses coming. So um, we'd love uh, everybody to come. Thank you, um, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Thanks, guys.